Its imperialism was towards neighboring countries, not towards distant colonies like the European, uh, like uh, that of the European nations. And so it is, has this strange phenomenon that it has never defined itself by domestic achievements, but it has translated its foreign uh, efforts into domestic uh, achievements. So this has now come to an end with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Russia now is back to uh, where it started under Peter the Great at the beginning of the 18th century. And Russia now faces the challenge of finding a domestic mode of action in its own construction. But that requires a re-education in many respects of fundamental Russian attitudes. And it's always easier for the leaders to mobilize public attitudes along familiar lines towards Ukraine, towards Georgia, towards the territories that used to be uh, part of the Soviet Union. Now the instinctive reaction of Russia has always been to have a strong central government and even more than a strong central government, a strong leader. And throughout Russian history, even when Stalin was murdering tens of millions of people, the public belief was usually that the top leader was relatively benign and that if anything went wrong, it must have been done by his subordinates. This is the history in which most Russians grew up. Now Putin, who is vilified in our press, is extremely popular in Russia. All public opinion polls show that he has an approval rating of about 74%. And while he pretty well controls the television, the newspapers are relatively free. So one can read country reviews, uh, country reviews to Putin. Uh, it is probably true that he interprets some of American actions, both in Ukraine and Georgia and towards Russia, as an attempt to weaken the way he governs. And I think it is probably true that this has led, as the questioner implies, to a worsening of relations. Some of this was perhaps unavoidable, some of it perhaps avoidable. But it, I think the question uh, is well put, and I would agree as a factual analysis that it has a lot of merit. Okay. Here's one about the United Nations. Has the UN outlived its usefulness, or was it ever useful? If so, when and how? The UN uh, represents about 190 uh, sovereign countries. When it started, it had about 50 countries in 1945. So it has undergone enormous changes. These countries in the General Assembly vote uh, as nations. And sometimes uh, they cannot be instructed properly. For example, I can give you an example from my personal experience. We conducted a negotiation while I was in office about deep sea mining how to put it under some sort of internet, give, give a lot of nations access to some of the results while having special benefits for the nations or groups of nations that could actually do the uh, mining. 
leaving aside the merit of that dispute, there was one uh, representative from a developing country, a minor, a very small developing country, that had no coastline, so it wasn't even, who A, made himself a tremendous expert on the subject, and secondly, uh, made our life hell in the negotiation. And so I went to his government to see why they were doing this. And it turned out the government did not have the foggiest idea about deep sea mining. <laughs> and that he was doing this uh, uh, on his own. Now, as a general proposition, I would say this. There are a number of things in which the United Nations can do a very good job. For example, refugees, disaster relief, uh, technical subjects which do not involve disagreement among the great powers. Uh, the United Nations also has done good work when the big powers have agreed on settling a dispute in supplying uh, forces that can check an agreement to which both sides have agreed. What the United Nations has never done well is instead of peacekeeping, contributing to peacemaking. That is, introducing forces that would actually change the attitudes of a parties. They have not been able to do it at, in the Security Council unless the uh, permanent members agree. And they haven't been able to do it uh, on the ground. And we will soon have seen, see this tested in Lebanon because we have introduced, or the UN has introduced, uh, peacekeeping forces into southern Lebanon. But in order to do it by United Nations principles, they have to do it with the approval of the host country. But the government of the host country, namely Lebanon, is weaker than Hezbollah. So they, the host country has no power with respect to Hezbollah. And if Hezbollah manages to take over the local government, the peacekeeping force will be operating in a vacuum. So right now, when things are settling down, that force is uh, doing, I suppose, a reasonable job. But if rearmament were to start again, and if a conflict developed, we would see what, what uh, can be done. So I think on the peacemaking aspect, the United Nations has not been effective at all. Uh, it, prov it among the, in addition to the things that I've mentioned, it provides a forum where it is easy to start a dialogue with countries where it is otherwise more complicated. But it is not what it's often described in, in some of, uh, of the more well-meaning papers, a force which can act as an international government. It has never come close to that. What sort of role have you played in advising the current administration on foreign policy concerns, specifically the war on terror? What role? Who? Have you, what role have you played in advising the current Bush administration on foreign policy issues, such as the war on terror? You. Mm -hmm. Thou. Look. Uh, uh, I have taken the position that I will not talk about conversations I have with the president. Uh, anybody who had s seen presidents in action knows that they must have the possibility to call in some people for personal discussions, put up their feet, and not worry how this will play in the press. 